We have all seen NASCAR's largest crash in history, right? But how much do we actually know about it? Today, we are diving into this crash to uncover some of the details you probably didn't know about the wreck, background information on it, and cover some of the wild details about rest of the race. This is the story behind NASCAR's biggest crash. Most people watching the wreck for the first time are probably like, a lot of these cars look completely different than each other. Well, this is because this was a NASCAR modified sportsman race, which was a combination race between the NASCAR Late Model Sportsman National Championship and the NASCAR Modified National Championship. The Late Model Sportsman Championship eventually turned into what is the modern day Xfinity series, and the Modified National Championship eventually turned into the modern day Will and Modified Tour. So this race took place on February 13th, 1960. It was the day before the legendary 1960 Daytona 500 that saw Junior Johnson take home the checkered flag. Kind of going with the theme here, this race also turned into the Daytona 300 that the modern day Xfinity series runs. The history of this race in the modified sportsman series dates back to 1950 when the series ran races on the beaches of Daytona the Friday or Saturday before the big guys in the Grand National series ran. In 1959, the two and a half mile high banked Daytona Oval was completed, and the modified Sportsman Series ran the day before the first ever Daytona 500 that same year. Okay, so with that background information, we can finally get into the 1960 race. Carl Burris and Banjo Matthews qualified on the front row. Burris had a pole time of 62 seconds, 13 seconds slower than this year's Xfinity Daytona qualifying time which was clocked in by Austin Hill at just over 49 seconds. Wildly enough, Fireball Roberts was in this race and qualified in third place right behind the pair of Burris and Matthews. This race took place just the day after Fireball captured a win in his Daytona 500 qualifier race, which at the time counted as an actual race win. Other notable drivers in the field included Junior Johnson, Lee Petty, and Ralph Earnhardt. So there are conflicting sources on the number of cars that even started this race. Some sources, including a newspaper article from the very next day on February 14, 1960, state that 68 cars took the green flag. However, other sources say that 73 cars took the green flag. Ultimate Racing History shows that 73 cars started, but there was a 74th car that, quote, did not start. So I'm not sure if the difference here in the sources comes down to genuine misinformation around the race, or if 68 cars literally took the green flag and just a handful of cars did not start the race on time. I think the latter may be the case, because some cars are shown to not have a starting position on Ultimate Racing History. And by some, I mean exactly 5, so that adds up 68 cars according to some sources, plus the 5 who started from either the pit lane or started late, adds up to 73 cars. So something else weird with Ultimate Racing History, it shows that Earl Moss qualified his car, started in 17th, but did not end up with a finishing position. Anyways, Bill France led the field in the pace car for the opening pace laps. Then the cars got going. They're racing! Andrew Matthews grabs the lead. Fireball Roberts right behind him as they climb the bank into the first turn. In turn four of just the very first lap, the biggest NASCAR crash in history occurred. The leader's at record speed, but the rest of the field is in trouble back in the fourth turn. takes 37 cars out of the race. Cars slid sideways, cars ramped off each other, flipped, turned on their sides. It's unbelievable to watch. So my first question was who caused this wreck? It started with Dick Foley, who bobbled in the exit of turn four and spun across the track onto the apron. Larry Frank, Ed Flimke, and Al Hager were closely behind and triggered the wreck trying to avoid the spinning Foley machine. Frank stated that number 68 bobbled in the turn and everything happened all at once. My car flipped once, became airborne, 
and completely sailed over the number 21. Incredibly, Dick did not receive a scratch on his car and was able to continue on the race and, by the end of it, come home with a 10th place finish. The first car you can see overturned in the video is the number 40 of Stan Cross, and then many cars start to pile up and turn over. Here, you can see a car launch off another car near the apron and fly through the air. Another car on the actual track just tumbled for what seemed to be an eternity before the camera turned away to capture more cars piling into the wreck. There's just so much going on that you don't even know what to look at. Eight drivers were injured as a result of the wreck, but none were too serious. There were also, of course, no fatalities or I wouldn't have shown it. Four drivers were released from the hospital the day of the incident. However, there were four drivers kept at least one night. This included Jack McLaughlin and Will Cagle with neck-related injuries, Bill Wark with a leg fracture, and Bill Rafter who had an injured leg, left elbow, and shoulder. A good point brought up by some of the drivers was the fact that it was a miracle an enormous fire didn't break out. For example, look at the 1951 Langhorne National Open pileup that many of the drivers were comparing this wreck to. The red flag was displayed for 39 minutes to clean up the wreckage. But even after the wreck, the race had a lot of notable moments from here too. The race did restart and Banjo Matthews led the field back to green. Just a few laps later, Matthews had engine troubles and Fireball Roberts took the lead. On lap 23, rain began to fall and the caution came out. However, the field did not come to a halt under a red flag, but instead paraded behind the pace car for the next 34 laps of the race. The yellow lasted an hour to wait out the rain. So, this was disappointing, 34 laps of caution because of rain, but it did allow cars that were damaged in the opening wreck to get back out there and complete some laps, like the 43 of Al Hager. This shows Fireball Roberts coming down to refuel his car on a very wet pit road under the yellow. This is also a good time to point out that a bunch of the cars from the opening wreck were still stranded in the infield. They literally just left them there. A pile of cars were literally on the racetrack during the entire race. That's something that would never happen now. Finally, the race restarted on lap 57. Just three laps later, Carl Burris, the pole sitter, and a driver fighting in the top three all race long, had horrible heat exhaustion and was relieved by Marvin Punch. Punch would be able to drive up and finish in second place, and both drivers were awarded the second place finishing position. With just five laps to go, Fireball was cruising to a win. That was until he had an electrical failure and he came to a stop on the backstretch. Incredibly, Tiny Lund, the future Daytona 500 champion, pushed Fireball Roberts back to his pits during the final few laps of the race under green flag conditions. So with Fireball out, it essentially handed the win to Bubba Farr who was in second place. Something else that I think is funny is that the commentator of this video that you've been watching announced that Carl Burris finished second place, but that machine was of course piloted by Marvin Punch. After the race, Joe Weatherly was caught for driving too fast in the rain under yellow conditions earlier in the race, and afterwards was penalized three laps, dropping his third place finish down to eighth. Fireball Roberts finished the race in sixth place, four laps down. Lee Petty finished in seventh place, four laps down. The only two finishers on the lead lap were race winner Bubba Farr and the two second place finishers Burris and Punch. Only 45 drivers in the field of 74 completed more than 10 laps of the race and only 38 made it past halfway. The time of the race was an astonishing 2 hours and 8 minutes, much longer than the 1959 race. That about does it. I hope you were able to gain a little bit of knowledge and have a little bit more context the next time that you watch this crash and now you know a little bit more about what actually happened in the race. Anyways guys, that's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.